Maybe just a few words before you start. Uh, since 2001, um, Schmidt, Kolinin, Schmöger, and Saifang have collaborated on artistic and curatorial projects. And interestingly enough, um, most of these projects actually um, address situations in Cuba or took place in Cuba. And um, the team consists of uh, Florian, who is a Berlin-based conceptual artist uh, and filmmaker, and uh, also a teacher professor at Umeå uh, Academy of Fine Arts in Sweden, and uh, in Aarhus in Denmark. Um, Lisa and Alexander are a former Vienna-based architectural practice and uh, practice of artistic research. And uh, over several years, you have been working um, on architecture and film in Cuba, and you developed also very different positions, very often in the context of the Havana Biennale. Uh, the first um, attempt was, or project was in 2003, uh, where you basically um, installed a structure that was inhabited and, and played with by a, a number of artists. It was probably more an uh, organizational and curatorial role, if I may say so. Probably totally wrong. No, uh, you can correct it. And uh, th the second time then at, at the Havana Biennale uh, was uh, an artistic project that you presented there. And uh, we're very happy to have you here. Um, and uh, I hope you have all seen uh, their installation uh, in the exhibition hall, Micro Brigades, uh, Variations of a Story. A warm welcome. Thank you very to much. You. Nicolas, one question. Uh, we were asked or supposed to speak in German, but you could easily also speak in English. Oh, yeah. no problem. What is it? What shall we do? We can switch. What do you want? No. Well, we could continue in English. English. Uh, yeah. Then we keep the section in English. Um, yes, um, our. Okay. This is uh, already a view into uh, San Agustin, one of the, um, one of the um, sites of Havana that we have been looking into in the last uh, five or six years and uh, that, were, uh, that are also at the, uh, the subject of our video that we have downstairs in, uh, in the exhibition in the hall. Our presentation here, Lisa and me being here, Alexander sitting here uh, and uh, observing us, <laughs> the remote control, um, was uh, announced as a commented screening, and, uh, but knowing that the film is downstairs, we decided to, uh, to enhance the comment and uh, reduce the screening a little bit. But um, what we want to present here is nonetheless also a kind of film, maybe more like a slideshow, and uh, uh, we will also stick to the visuals and the images that uh, also have influenced our filmic ideas. Downstairs, the video is half an hour long. So, where do we start? Well, in uh, Cuba, we one should say uh, our discussion at least started with the moment uh, of the revolution, and uh, one of the big questions of the revolution was housing. So what we want to look at now is a little bit of also pre, but mostly, of course, uh, after revolutionary housing, uh, a visual of which you see here. But uh, what we should, of course, mention also that there was a lot of architecture going on in Cuba before uh, the revolution, not only advanced uh, single-family housing by uh, international art architects, but also buildings, uh, huge, huge um, living units, like here the Foxa building in the Vedado district of Havana, built 1956, and at the time of its finalization, the largest uh, steel concrete construction worldwide. Um, but we want to go back at this moment then what happened then in 1959 with the revolution things changed what happened was uh, not only political change but also and 
this is what brings us here together, the architect and the filmmaker, um, also a change in uh, cultural politics. Filmmaking started to be very important. Uh, a filmic institute was founded, the ICAIC, and uh, the two films, the first films that were initiated at that moment, uh, right after the revolution, one was about agricultural reform and the other one was about housing. This is uh, La Vivienda by Julio uh, Garcia Espinosa, but only very short excerpt. Well, maybe this film is not coming up here. Maybe. <coughs> Technical problems here. Maybe we just start to. Ah, here we go. Okay. Sound? Ah, it's very minimal, the sound, sorry. This is not quite the uh, original score, but it is already the version that we have included in our film as a part of the film downstairs. But what you see is the confrontation of the rich, the rich families living in the houses and the many poor families living in slum-like uh, uh, developments. And uh, obviously, have a, the revolution was triggered and was also caused and was also promised that this, there would be a solution to it. So here finally you see the contrast, that was the bright future looming up with the housing built for all of the families uh, in the country. The first of uh, these solutions maybe started already earlier before the revolution that was Havana del Este. At least the building, uh, the, the planning started before that and I will hand of this to Lisa now. One couldn't separate the pre-revolution and post-revolution time and that uh, clear shape. So Havana del Este is one project which shows a very interesting continuity from before and after. Havana del Este is also called uh, unit number one, uh, which refers uh, to the, the neighborhood unit planning, which was very in, in common and uh, discussed internationally in the 50s. The basis for the whole development of, of East Havana was actually the, the plan and the idea to build, in, in 93, to build a, a tunnel under the, the, um, the bay, which uh, allowed them to, to open uh, uh, for construction all these uh, areas eastern, on the eastern coast. And so this was a, basically a, also a land speculation project from uh, before uh, the revolution, as you can see here on the plan, the location east and um, here you see Old, Old Havana and uh, East Havana. So interesting, this discussion of, uh, of the neighborhood unit uh, quite internationally. Uh, you see here that it is uh, um, one uh, unit was then built, it was construction actually was started then according to, to a master plan. Uh, and one unit uh, was built. You see that uh, there is this uh, uh, circulation uh, for car traffic, which uh, forms the boundary uh, of, the, of the whole area. And also interesting to see that uh, the, the core basically is, the, is empty. The core is for the sports fields for, and for the green area. And the houses are regrouped around. And then smaller streets are just uh, uh, going as a cul-de-sac into the uh, area and uh, inside its pedestrian area. Also, of course, uh, what was important, the addition of uh, uh, common program as schools, um, but also shopping facilities. 
and uh, the pedestrian area and uh, the, the greenery inside. Havana de Leste was also then called Ciudad Camila Suenfuego. So this was part of then the appropriation uh, process of, uh, of the government uh, to take, to show off this project as one uh, important project uh, of the revolution, standing next to other important projects as the, the uh, Kuchaye campus, a university building, and the, the famous art schools, which were also constructed in, in uh, the beginning of the 60s. So this was done. Uh, also very sh showed off at the, in 63 there was uh, an international architecture grand congress in Havana where more than 2,000 international architects were uh, coming and they were all uh, visiting uh, uh, this uh, complex. And you see that um, and also in the section that is uh, a, a more demanding architecture we have a, a split level and also a reaction to the climate with these uh, ventila possibilities of ventilation. Um, just some, some images of, uh, also you see the, the relation of uh, very high buildings, the 11 store buildings to the, to the lower buildings. So this was all these concepts of how uh, to create an, uh, an interesting uh, a neighborhood. But of course, so this was uh, for um, a th around 1,300 a, a uh, housing units. So it was a very unique project, and of course it, this was not a project where uh, the question of housing could really uh, solve on a larger scale. So it, re it remained a problem, and then uh, slowly voices became uh, more heard uh, that um, were uh, proposing prefabrication as, as a solution for mass housing, um, and uh, especially the big panel uh, production. Actually, in '63, there was a large uh, hurricane who was uh, devastating part of the, of the country, and then the Soviet Union uh, financed a production plant of these uh, large panels, the, it was called the, the Grand Panel, Grand Panel 5, which was also used in the Soviet Union, but actually derives from the French uh, Camus system. So this was used uh, in, 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 in the 60s for a couple of, of buildings, but so the advantages are obvious. You have less uh, work and also you need uh, less wood, which actually was a topic at, ti at the time in, in uh, Cuba. Um, but as you can see, the construction process, it's also it needs a heavy prefabrication, so it needs a lot of uh, uh, material, but also a lot of uh, technical equipment. So, uh, in the end, uh, this uh, large panel uh, prefabrication didn't uh, really uh, solve the problem. So, another solution which was thought of was then, why not uh, let people build uh, their houses uh, themselves? And through this, the ideas of the micro-brigades were pronounced first in uh, 1970. And this is very interesting because 1970 is, is a year where another enormous, uh, huge collective project was uh, pronounced and proclaimed, which was uh, uh, the, the 10, million, uh, 10 million tons uh, sugar harvest, um, which was to be uh, reached within uh, one year, and which was actually nearly reached. Uh, they just missed it uh, about uh, 1.5 tons, and you see that it was also a, a large uh, um, campaign in uh, the television and uh, cinema who was then promoting this project. But um, it was nearly reached, but nonetheless uh, it ended in a, in a kind of economic catastrophe because there was a, a large breakdown because of the machines breaking down, because the transport of not being able to handle the amount. And uh, this is, for example, so that is the situation that we face at this moment, the beginning of the 70s, which is also called uh, the gray quintennium, the gray uh, uh, year fifth, so to say. There is an interesting film by Chris Marker, his second film, actually, that he made, uh, Visiting Cuba Again, and where he uses uh, a lot of material by Santiago Alvarez, uh, news material and the likes where he describes the failure of this zafra, this harvest of uh, the 10 millions. The 10 million, the film is called uh, La Bataille de 10 Millions, but it starts with a very interesting uh, paragraph for us also, because it says basically, uh, when the revolution turns to normal, we, we being the people from Europe, maybe looking at uh, this direction, we turn our eyes away. When there is no 
when there is no victory more to be uh, celebrated or when there is no uh, martyrs to be uh, mourned, then we get bored and we turn towards something else. With this film, he wanted to look also at what it means that uh, a post-revolutionary uh, momentum, also under the condition of the boycott already in place by the US, what it means to get to normal life and to try to build things uh, uh, on a level that has to uh, face uh, the typical problems like uh, monetary funds and the like. The film ends then, uh, the film also contains uh, material of Fidel Castro speaking uh, about the Safra, first announcing it and later then uh, there's a, a very famous speech of how he, well he doesn't defend the lose, in fact he claims that uh, his enemies or the Cubans' enemies, they were right when they would say that they failed. But we will go on, we will continue. Micro brigades then were initiated also on this background that manufacturers maybe would not have enough work, so why not get the people out to build their own housing? Um, so what we then also uh, uh, describe in the film, groups of 33 untrained people, of which uh, a, a larger amount male, small amount female, build houses up to six stories high, each unit up to 36 apartments. So that's far from building your own little private uh, house on the, on, on the ground. We try to get now here one film example again. <laughs> las instalaciones eléctricas. Pero fundamentalmente son necesarios los hombres. El esfuerzo que realizan en la hermosa tarea de crear una casa. Para estos hombres es que se ha hecho este documental. Para estos constructores que participan de la transformación que ha sufrido el concepto del pasado de lo que era un trabajador asalariado, por este nuevo trabajador que va a llenar sus necesidades de vivienda y las de su colectivo con plus trabajo. So, uh, okay, this might be now have caused a little problems for the translators, but basically what the film says next to all the material and uh, the means, it needs people to build a house. And this is a film made by Nicolas Guillén Landrian, published in, uh, uh, no, presented in 1971 through the ICAIC. Uh, and uh, there's two things that, I, that we want to mention about this also. It should not go unnoticed that this was a film like a more like a heroic uh, documentation about how these houses are built with a good cause. But it should also be mentioned that Nicolas Guillén Landrian before made documentaries that were far more critical of his own country and uh, leadership, which got him into deep trouble. So, for example, his film Kofia Arabiga, which you find on YouTube, um, it was a very important one that caused him a lot of trouble. Our film also owes a lot to Nicolas Guillén Landrian because we kind of refer to his filmic language uh, in many ways. Now, this I hand it to you again. So you see one, one of these very uh, simple buildings, four, uh, five stories high. And to build these uh, buildings is not only that it needs people, but it also uh, it means uh, building uh, with very simple means. So it also needs a simple plan. So actually already in the 60s, uh, there were studies at the Ministry of Construction going on how to develop a very efficient ground plan and also to e develop efficient building techniques. And there was, there was uh, these, these test designs uh, called Edificio 1, Edificio 2, 3, and uh, um, then one... Um, Test building was was constructed apparently in the in the courtyard of uh, uh, the National School of uh, Communist Party instructors, where uh, there were um, one of these buildings building blocks uh, with two staircases and uh, five stories high, which was apparently built by three people uh, within uh, only uh, six months. Um, so actually, when then then the. Um, 
And this plan of the 10 million tons of sugar uh, or, or couldn't be completed. It was immediately that Castro brought up this new pro pro program. And uh, so the Ministry of Construction had to react fast, and they drew out of their uh, drawer the plans that existed. And this was, at the moment then, it was the type E14, so Edificio uh, uh, 14, which just became then the standard uh, blocks for uh, a large-scale uh, mass uh, housing. So here you see uh, uh, one of these uh, examples. Um, it's a very, it's very simple floor plan based on a, a three meters uh, a grid. And uh, here we see that it's uh, three staircases. Um, and then we have this uh, um, four or five, depending, very simple room. So you enter directly into the living room, uh, have one unit for um, the, the water and kitchen and um, uh, two sleeping rooms. Then, um, so it started with E14, and then E14 improved, as you can see on the, on the uh, lower plan, and um, was added a patio in the back. So this was the kind of uh, improvement that were uh, at, uh, at that time um, possible within the Ministry of Construction. So, uh, so here you see uh, just uh, two uh, views of the inside. So you see it's either the balcony or the lodger is integrated in the house. And what you can also see is that this building with simple means uh, also proposed a, a simple technique. So for example, the windows, uh, they were placed uh, directly at the concrete frames or under the uh, concrete frames. So there was no uh, um, complicated part, uh, parts to be uh, constructed. So the micro-brigades built for themselves, but also they built for others. And this was actually uh, what, what contributed also to, to the failure of, of this uh, program, because so actually they were supposed to build uh, these uh, housings for the others of the company who couldn't go to the construction site. Um, and then in the end, uh, the housing was distributed according uh, to needs, but also according to merits that they did in, within their uh, within their company. So it was clear that whenever you were more uh, critical to the to the regime, it was uh, it became nearly impossible to get an apartment. And it also um, there were people who who worked for years and years with more and more projects and never obtained an apartment. So this is one. Uh, part of the story, which uh, is uh, a simple, wonderful idea, but of course, in its reality, uh, has has many, many uh, uh, different uh, uh, facets. Maybe, but maybe one shouldn't speak of a failure uh, as such, but more of the uh, run of the reason of a slowdown and a diminishing uh, uh, will to participate. But after all, it was like about 20,000 units that they built, or more. No, um, it was it was enormous. Really, at the beginning of the 70s, so from 71 to to um, 75, and all in all, it was like 80,000 unit, so this is really mass uh, production. Um, but, but then it faced uh, these problematics of not having uh, enough material and not couldn't cope with that. But um, we wanted to give just brief insight in two areas that we were looking more closely uh, for our research in the film, which are two neighborhoods which uh, arise at the same uh, time and are constructed with the same uh, building type, both started in uh, 71. Uh, Alama in the east, so more east than Havana del Este, and uh, San Agustin uh, in the west. Um, here you can see uh, uh, how this um, uh, E14 uh, block constitutes uh, the whole neighborhood, and you can see this enormous dimension. These houses today it houses 100,000 uh, uh, people who live there. Uh, actually, the construction started from, from west and then slowly uh, moved uh, to the east, which is also interesting to, to see in the plan that uh, on, uh, on the left side you see it's a more, still more organic planning and then uh, towards, uh, towards uh, the, the east, so towards how time is progressing, it becomes more and more formal, so it becomes this very geometrical uh, shapes which are just turning the, the building blocks and in a 45 uh, degree angle, which of course produces a kind of uh, strange but also uh, interesting uh, spaces. This is one image from, from the uh, quite a Western part now of, this, of the Alama settlement. Uh, they are then named like micro uh, one, two, three, this is micro 10. Um, and so how time moves, uh, this is also not uh, 
constructed by the classical micro brigades. Uh, it, it were also then uh, prisoners who were included into the construction uh, of uh, these buildings. If we look at this other settlement in, uh, in, in the west, San Augustine, it's interesting that with the same, exactly the same building block, so there's, there's 45 meters uh, along and nine meters uh, uh, width, uh, it's nevertheless quite a different neighborhood uh, which arises. Uh, here you see the, the plan, you see the dimension of the uh, same uh, blocks. And uh, what is interesting that uh, in San Augustine there had been an, an, an pl an plan, a plot plan, a parcellation existing before, and so it was uh, in the, in the uh, early 50s when this were a, a little distributed into little lots where people uh, built their uh, kind of holiday houses or little fincas, and uh, so this was kind of an existing pattern and. Um, then the large uh, blocks, they, they uh, intervene and superimpose with this fabric, which of course uh, makes a different uh, kind of uh, a neighborhood and also it's uh, closer to the center uh, of Havana and easier to reach. Because the Alamar uh, settlement is also called uh, Siberia by the people because it's so uh, far from everything and uh, difficult to reach as public transport uh, definitely degraded completely. It has an incredible lively hip hop scene by the way. Yeah. So there, there is another like chapter or aspect uh, which uh, we wanted to to bring in because it's uh, quite interesting the way how uh, how the micro brigades dealt with different systems, building uh, systems, and then also with the use and misuse or mixture of uh, a different uh, system. One one uh, which um, we came across is the Sistema Giron. And the Sistema Giron didn't have anything to do with housing. It was also developed in uh, 1970. It was uh, developed uh, along um, this idea to build uh, large-scale schools in the countryside. Um, this went along with the plan to increase the production of, of citrus plants and um, to, to have the idea to educate and at the same time make people work on the plantars. And, um, so there was a, a system, construction system needed which was very flexible to build these schools, uh, easy to, to, to be transported, and uh, this is system, Jérôme, uh, with a span of uh, six meter, a uh, very simple system with columns and uh, this uh, slept uh, pre under, under pretension uh, was then developed for exactly these kind of uh, school buildings where there was and the, and the, within a couple of years, I think within two years, there were 500 of these schools. Um, one, 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 detail about, one detail only about this uh, image, you might see it from uh, far, I hope. The school is called Olof Palme. The, the Cubans had strong connection with Sweden and at that uh, moment were also very admiring the Sweden One Million program. So when we talk to them now, 25, 30 years later, uh, 40 years later, they always told us, yeah, but the Swedes, they really built the one million because the Cubans are as often the most critical of their own uh, uh, program and um, it's also of this one. So one, one, one detail, we see that this, uh, that this the slap under tension also had creates some uh, s sculptural uh, ideas which are quite nice. In, in the meantime, uh, the E14 type was uh, um, added. There was another t building uh, type developed, uh, which was called the SP2072, uh, um, uh, so the super panel developed in 1972. And uh, the change was that now um, these, uh, um, it was a mix of, of prefabrication and then manual labor. And so this prefabricated system allowed spans now uh, of six meters. And this was, the interest in this was that also maybe the ground floor could be used for other things, which was definitely not possible with the E14. The ground plans, uh, nevertheless, they stay exactly the same. So it is uh, just this uh, change of, of the construction system. And then through this change of the six meters, and having this mass of material produced for the schools, it became just a very uh, natural uh, Cuban way of uh, working that these uh, slabs were then integrated into housing uh, building. As you can hear, see here that these are these minor changes in the facade that you can see this uh, sculptural element of this uh, slab. And also you see that uh, the, the, uh, if you remember the, the images from the um, 
from inside before, it is the same, the same uh, living room with this uh, three meters uh, width, and then you have just half of this uh, slab, uh, which could, of course, span uh, the double. The slab being the ceiling element. Correct? Good. Yeah, this was soon then also taken out of uh, the system and, being, and uh, being there in large masses. It found also new ways of using it. So here, for example, you see the same ceiling element turned around and used as a bench. And then here in the next image, you see the same ceiling element now building the ceiling of a bus station. But we found it also as a pathway construction. And uh, that was also the reason. Um, so there was, it just turned out that this is a system with manifold usages, if you like it to be. And this was for us the reason to single out this element also in a first, uh, first uh, installational um, version of uh, Micro Brigade's variations of a story that we did for the, um, for the Alternativa in Gdansk and where, um, where we have this, uh, we have like a cast of the ceiling element that theoretically could be filled with concrete and making such an element to be used now also in this new location. In the background, there's a poster of the older grand panel system, and next to it, there's a small monitor with an amount of, with 40 slides, which were then at that moment basically starting to build up the story for us, the story that we wanted to tell, and which then uh, in the next version we later turned into this film that premiered in the Berlinale here in uh, Berlin, which uh, is now visible downstairs in the exhibition starting every full and every half hour, everything goes right, and where you can also see a lot of people interviewed, that were, uh, like Mario Cuyula, town planner and architect and artist, and there you will see also what, uh, what we described before, that there's so many ways that this program, which was successful in numbers, nonetheless can also be criticized, and is of course especially best criticized by the people who live in it or by the people who have been working with it, by the Cubans. So one comment to this was, for example, that when we showed Mario Cuyula, the film later, he said just uh, he didn't find it critical enough. Um, that being it. No, and I mean, one, one idea also why we wanted to change that format, not to, to, um, to show the film, is that for us it's not a story which stops. We are just, I mean, it's the whole material is really a way of collecting, traveling, collecting. And because, of course, the, all this information on housing in Cuba is very difficult. Uh, to access, and it has so many different aspects. And uh, so we still, still go on, and we still go uh, regularly and look for where the new micro-brigade uh, system, because continuously we hear that they still exist. And uh, what we also included in the exhibition are uh, two photographs of um, two projects which were presented to us as, as micro-brigades, and then we visited them, and in this case we we also uh, found workers who were there on the construction site and, and explained us, yeah, yeah sure, sure, this is a micro-brigade. It's a brigade that builds house by house. But it turned out that they had not really, and, uh, or they had lost this notion that the micro-brigades built for themselves. They just linked it uh, with the idea that a brigade builds a house and then another house and this idea of small uh, uh, company, which uh, is a brigade. So it, this was interesting for us to see that this term of uh, micro-brigades is, is so present everywhere, but the notion seems to shift at the moment. Even, and even though in the case of the last images, you were talking about the uh, construction for by military and for military, where soldiers were involved, so in a kind of new way interpreting it, there was a brigade that was building for themselves. Mm. Yeah, and it's also interesting that it was uh, still one uh, circle, one company building for themselves, which was also the case uh, for another settlement which was uh, presented as a micro brigade, but which was always uh, told to us, this is a, it is a micro style building. And uh, this is a settlement in, uh, um, in uh, Nuevo Vedado, uh, where it was told that it's a kind of me medicine collective who started to build these uh, small houses, so there are always two uh, apartments in these uh, uh, houses. And apparently, as you can see, uh, the way how the windows are placed and how the attica is formed and the colors, of course, are somehow referring aesthetically the, to the micro brigades. And so we found that interesting that this is introduced as an aesthetic uh, category. But I mean, this is all part of a still ongoing uh, project. Yes. So we hope to present more soon, but this is it for now. 
Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much um, for the insights and extension, in a way, of uh, what you are showing in the exhibition. I, I was wondering, maybe you can clarify one one uh, point: um, is somehow the relation between planning, like engineers or architects, and the micro brigades? Was there any contact, or was this just a kind of top-down? Um, process where a where prefab elements and a standard house was somehow given to the workers and then they um, started building yeah. just to to get a, maybe the larger picture picture of planning in a way. It's actually interesting because when we saw these buildings first, we thought that uh, planning and design would be more involved also by the inhabitants. And there was this building with the stars, you might have re remember. But then we also found out that this, this building has stars because there are military veterans living in there, and this also comes uh, from, from above. So there is this very little margins of designing the grids of, their, of, of the windows. And it was actually really that plans were handed out to these micro-brigades and that, uh, that this exact plan of the E14 was like copied like in staples. We, of course, we would have loved to find these documents. It was uh, impossible. But um, so this, and then there was in the micro brigade, there was always uh, one or two skilled people who was involved. But this was not n none of the architects or none of the planners. Um, there is a, in our film, there is, for example, Daniel, the architect, uh, commenting that uh, when he got involved in it, he's a younger, uh, he's a generation that worked with it in the late 80s and 90s. They tried, well, late 80s, they tried to restart the program and they felt like, yeah, this is much less centralized than before. And they felt really kind of looking towards a future and towards something else. But then uh, the, East, uh, the Eastern Bloc broke down and the money went away because it was a huge subsidized by the uh, Soviet Union. So that moment, and we called it another variation of the story, that moment after being uh, a rise again, there was another crack, uh, crackdown for the, for the whole project. And, um, but then also towards the end of our film, he's also announcing basically, I mean, it could be so easy. Give, give, the, give out the land, give some loans, and let the people just build without this control from top down. Uh, I think it's, it's a really uh, incredibly interesting uh, research and an example also that somehow contradicts some of the cliches of self-building and, and, and planning on the other side um, because it, it shows um, really interesting contradictions also and, and productive misunderstandings also what you can do with uh, proof of elements. Maybe we can have maybe one or two questions uh, because we are stretching probably um, the limits of what we can do here with our beloved technicians. Um, is there, are there any questions? <laughs> All overwhelmed. <laughs> overwhelmed. Oh, yeah. There is one. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, when I was there in, in Cuba, it was long ago, so, uh, but what, what they told us a lot was about the difficulties uh, concerning the materials. You mentioned it, just if you can talk a little bit more about that, uh, that this kind of mass production of housing faced uh, a lot of trouble because of the difficulties imposed by, by the, what you call, the impossibility of importing some kind of important materials, construction. This is a, was continuously a, a continuous discussion with also many variations to follow our idea of uh, what kind of ups and downs this uh, had. And uh, it, 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 it came and went with the, the different associations. Basically, for example, I mentioned it before, but I didn't go into detail when uh, uh, in the beginning of the 70s, in, in the beginning the revolution was not even so much close to be say that, that this is a, a, a socialist revolution, but then towards the 70s basically they had to work closer with the uh, Soviet Union, the East Bloc, so the first uh, prefab systems came from Yugoslavia, is this right, Lisa? 
Yeah, there were many different systems imported from, from Europe. Yeah. So they were up and up and down. There was also then related to the ability of these foreign states to support the, um, uh, the, the ideas in Cuba. They were dependent on that. What we have also in the film is, for example, then also that there's a concrete plant that was a, a gift by the GDR and that was opened uh, uh, by Erich Honecker himself visiting the country, but also this took like eight years to build, and uh, so it's, uh, it was always a slow slowing down and an uh, and increasing of uh, speed on the basis of how much material was uh, available. And then the 90s saw, of course, a very hard cut down on these kind of things, but actually we also, also by now we do not see a very lively uh, home program there. The military that was the buildings that you saw, which were the newest ones, second from last before the doctor's ones. The military, of course, always uh, had uh, the first hand on material and is closest to it because the military not only is uh, um, basically the military power, they also, co uh, they also traditionally control the tourism, and tourism means at the moment the most money. Uh, Raoul, which is now the president, was before the head of the military. So you can see why military units can be built, but hardly anything else is built at the moment. There are some private initiatives, though, but minimal. Yeah. Okay, I think we... Here, Francisca. As has the last word, almost, but you have to answer. not directly um, related to housing. Um, as far as I know, there were problems after the breakdown of uh, the Eastern uh, uh, community or whatever, Warsaw Pact uh, uh, here in, in, in Europe uh, without uh, uh, subsidizing by the Soviet Union and uh, GDR or whatever. Uh, I've heard uh, about uh, a shortage uh, shortage of uh, nutrition, and uh, as far as I know, Havana is important for this kind of urban agriculture, people using uh, spaces not occupied by doing uh, gardening allotments, planting the potatoes or whatever. Have the in-betweens, in between those houses built by the brigades, uh, have been used uh, to plant uh, potatoes, tomatoes, or whatever. Or what, what, what do you know? Because I'm not very good informed about this problem. Yeah, it's, it's true that, that, that this necessity, of course, made people uh, grow their own uh, food in the, in, the, in the 90s and also uh, to have animals in their, in their uh, houses. So to have a pig at home was. Uh, yeah, it was just happening. Um, so, yeah, of course, I mean, this, this now excursions are undertaken to go to Havana to study this uh, urban farming, which is so en vogue here and there, just really happened because of the necessity. Um, actually, we have found it more in larger scales uh, within Havana than in these uh, large settlements. Uh, also there in, in, in small, uh, smaller areas, so there's um, sometimes like directly along the building there is a strip which is then cultivated, uh, either plants or, or, or food, but not uh, really in the dimension of having uh, fields in between. So. There is, <clears throat> there is different forms, though, of uh, nonetheless of, we wanted to make this excursion, but for time limits we didn't do it, uh, forms of how people living in these uh, uh, units, how they... Uh, make it themselves, one of them, but we didn't, it's really true, we didn't see much of agriculture directly connected to the housing, but we saw a lot of garages. And um, it's not the only country where one can observe that how much the garage space as a space where you can put things in, not only cars, but everything, then uh, how important it seemed to be. And so there's a lot of uh, shift, like makeshift kind of uh, small units of metal, of wood and anything. The town planners that were at that time connected with the micro brigades, they hated. They just hate it. It guys kind of completely like destroys their idea of how it should look like. But I mean, it's there. It's needed. It's done. You know. So that process. There is a process going on. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Florian and Lisa, and all of you, you. for your persistence. And thanks for your patience. Yeah. <laughs>